and as a other side and a hand. Yeah. One arm across, keep and keep the shoulder down and hold here. Okay, uh, this is an announcement for attendees in this Zoom meeting. Practice operating Zoom before the next talk. In questions and answers, raise your hand in Zoom. At the bottom of the Zoom screen, you can raise your hand from participants. Click raise hand to become familiar with the operation. Uh, Zoom でご参加の方にご案内です。発表前に Zoom の操作の練習をします。えー、質疑では Zoom の挙手機能を使います、えー。Zoom 画面の下に参加者アイコンがありますで、えー。そこから挙手ができます。操作になれるために挙手をしてみてください。Thank you very much. Please put your hand down. ありがとうございます。手を下ろしてください。続いても、Zoom 参加者へのお知らせです。トーク中は、Zoom のチャットに質問や感想を書いていただいて大丈夫です。You can write your questions and thoughts in the Zoom chat during the talk. 続いて、YouTube で見ている方にご連絡です。この部屋のハッシュタグは p y c o n j p ナンバーファイ5です。感想や気づきなどぜひハッシュタグ付きでツイートしてみてください。This is an announcement for attendees from YouTube Live.The hashtag for this room is p y c o n j p ナンバーファイ5 p l e a s e feel free to tweet your thoughts and observations with the hashtag. それではこれからジェシーさんの発表を始めます。タイトルは How to transform research oriented code into machine learning API with Python. です、えー。発表時間。Now we are going to start Jesse's presentation. The title is How to transform research oriented code into machine learning API with Python. 発表時間は、えー、質疑を含んで30分です。The presentation time is 30 minutes, including questions and answers. 発表前にマイクテストを兼ねてスピーカーに読み上げ事項を読,んで読み上げていただきます。Before the presentation, the speaker will read the paper for a micro context. Mr. Jesse, turn on your video and then read it, please. Okay. So, my name is Jesse Tetsuya Hirata. The title of my presentation is How to Transform Research Oriented Code into Machine Learning APIs with Python. My presentation will be in Japanese. The, the, the presentation materials are in Japanese. So I will publish the presentation materials and I agree to having my picture taken during my presentation. And I will comply with the PyCon JB Code of Conduct. Okay, Jesse, please share your screen again.
。それではジェシーさんを拍手でお迎えください。Please welcome Mr. Jesse with applause. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hi. I'm Jesse. I'm a software engineer working at an IT company specializing in education industry based in Tokyo. So, my Twitter account is Jesse Tetsuya. If you have an interest in this talk, I'm going to upload it on my Twitter so you can check it later. So, I mostly work in both data science and engineering. And have been involved with several data driven projects and have been implementing ML APIs and ML Ops environment. So, prior to the current job, I used to study and research the relationships between the online learning behaviors and the online learning outcomes of higher education in the UK. And before that, I used to maintain and develop the learning management system used for vocational schools and prep schools. So, today,、uh, based on these experiences, I'm going to try to talk about how I transform research oriented code into machine learning APIs with Python. So, the reason I'm going to talk about these topics is because recently Python engineers have more, more opportunities to work with data scientists or researchers than before. So, understanding the processes to develop ML APIs can help make AI ML projects work more smoothly. So, the target audience might be engineers who are working with data scientists or researchers, or engineers who are involved with AI ML projects. But this topic seems to be very broad. So, in this talk, And the development process can be different depending on each situation of your working place. So, <clears throat> before getting down to the main topic, let me tell you two premises in this talk. So, in this talk, I use sample code and sample data used for educational technologies. So, let me share. What educational technologies are like, what data can be stored, and how they are used. So, there is one major type of educational technologies,、uh, such as learning management system or online learning platform. For example, these are、uh, Moodle, Blackboard, Udemy, edX, Coursera, and Udacity, and others. So, these systems basically have several functions to help. Learners to study online. For example, online quiz function can be ever for students to take online quizzes. So, by using the functions, teachers, teachers can make online tests and distribute them to students. And the video lesson function can make it possible for students to take a lesson from home through PC screen. So, while they are using these functions, the learning log data. Is stored in database behind the online learning platform. So, the generally, the characteristics of the learning log data has time series format. So, that data includes what students take online tests and what kind of online tests are distributed, and when students take online tests, and whether they answer the quizzes or not. And get correct answers or not. So, by using the lo learning log data, data scientists write research oriented code through finding optimal ML models or algorithms. The engineers transform the research oriented code into ML APIs and integrated them into the learning management system or the online learning platform. So, this talk. Focuses on the processes of transformation from research oriented code into ML APIs, which is surrounded by the gray box on this slide. So, okay, so, all right, so now let's get down to the main topic. So, there are four steps. 
to transform research-oriented code into ML APIs. Understand the research-oriented code and modularize it and refactor it and the write the code to check how it can behave correctly. So first step is to understand the research-oriented code. I'm going to answer these questions. Uh, what is research-oriented code? What are ML APIs? How should engineers handle research-oriented code? So I will use Flask in sample code in this talk. So now let's look at definition of research-oriented code. Uh, research-oriented code in AI ML project is a code written mainly by data scientists or researchers and for figuring out the most efficient and suitable machine learning model. So machine learning APIs are composed of, of uh, mainly uh, three elements, preparation code, pre-processing code, and calculation, calculation code or ML code. Um, researchers focus more on writing pre-processing code and ML code through an iterative process, and it is integrated into production code. On the other hand, engineers have a responsibility to write the whole part of the code in production level. So this is an example of data pre-processing code written by researchers. This code seems to be long function and a use for loop, but this code can allow researchers to visually trace the code from the top to the bottom and easily and quickly write it. So this is a sample uh, calculation code with logistic regression. So this code use dot append and the data frame. So it can make researchers easily handle input data and trace output data with data frame. So this code is example of the code written by engineers. So this code seems to be much shorter than previous code and there are list comprehensions and set comprehension. And then there are two simple functions on the bottom. But actually, uh, this code builds a model in a much faster and a simpler way. Now, I identify three differences between uh, research-oriented code and production code. There are different scopes and different characteristics of coding style and different objectives coding styles. So researchers focus more on writing pre-processing code and ML code or calculation code. On the other hand, engineers have a responsibility to write whole part of the code in production level. So research-oriented code seems to be easily handled and visually traceable. And on the other hand, the production code need to be concerned about high calculation speed, high readability, and then should be testable and modular. This is because research is focused on finding the most efficient and suitable machine learning model. And on the other hand, engineers has, have a responsibility to make the code work on the server quickly and reliably. So now, um, what are Python engineers supposed to do for research-oriented code? So, modularize the research-oriented code into preparation code, processing code, ML code, or calculation code, and refactor them, and then write the code to check how it can work correctly. So now, second step is to modularize the code. So there's three small steps. First of all, categorize research-oriented code into preparation code, preprocessing code, and ML code. And second, break them out into functions and make them testable. And the last, qualify input and the output of the code and define URI. So this is a page of research-oriented code written on Jupyter Notebook. This code is 
written for calculating probabilities to get the students correct answers for certain questions of exams. The discord is procedural and some of them are not classified. It could be harder for us to understand the role of each code. So I, I actually wrote it, but I, I struggle to understand the code. Uh, this is because this research oriented code seems to be tightly coupled. So in order to categorize this code, find the code to load input data or access database first. It can be categorized as preparation code. So next, find the code to make, replace, filter, or delete input data. It can be pre-processing code. Then find the code to execute calculation or train data. It can be categorized as ML code or calculation code. So now I could categorize uh, research-oriented code into preparation code, preprocessing code, ML code, like the table on this slide. So at the same time, we could get modules for each from one page of research-oriented code. Preparation.py has functions to access BigQuery, execute query, and load input data, and rename columns. And preprocessing.py has functions to replace categorical data with discrete numbers and filter input data. And prediction.py has functions to calculate parameters, logistic regression, and item response theory. Uh, item response theory is also called as two parameters logistic regression. This is used for calculating probabilities to get students' correct answer. This is just a statistical method, it's used mainly in pedagogical domain. So, now we can see the research oriented code became uh, loosely coupled. So there is a table of input data on the left side on this slide, which is used for two parameters of logistic regression. On the right side, there's a table of output calculated by the model. The input data is about where the students answer each question correctly or not. Their item name, which is the name of question, item ID, how difficult each question is, subject name, exam name, and correction, which is binary data. On the other hand, output data is about probabilities to answer questions correctly. So the role of the API is to get probabilities. So we can directly level probabilities as endpoint name. So based on best practices, function name should be verb or verb plus noun. So the role of this function is to calculate the results or get probabilities. So we can level calculate result or get props as a function name. So understanding what data is input and the output which means understanding what data the code calculates and makes is considerably important. It is very considerably important step to make API. So now we could create a skeleton of ML API, uh, modularized from a page of research oriented code. So now we can move to refactoring phases, but we need to prepare for refactoring first. And there are two main parts of refactoring, which is IO and pandas code. So let's look at these uh, process, processes in more detail. And in this talk, I do not include refactoring of ML code or calculation code. This is because uh, this, code, this kind of code tend to be short and also most of uh, ML code is based on ML libraries. So there might not be, there might not be a spaces to rewrite or fix it. So the preparation code and the pre-processing code tend to be more redundant and repetitive than ML code. A big ball, big ball or mat means unstructured code. 
So unless we make the code more maintainable, the code to prepare and pre-process data will be the big ball of mud. So during the proof of concept with the short development cycles, for example, when rushing to write the code and develop model, and at the same time feeling, feeling business pressures, we tend to create big ball of mud with code of preparation and the pre-process. Because we try to uh, input several kinds of data and check output rather than we try to use several kinds of algorithms. After we finish to quickly write research oriented code and I look back to the code to prepare and pre-process, we can see several groups, groups of redundant or repeated code. So in this section, <clears throat> I will tell you the process to create the redundant and the repetitive code with sample code. <clears throat> so, but uh, before starting to refactor, we might need to understand more about the code. So in order to narrow down the requirement of each code, write the test code and take notes about the requirements of each code. So on this slide, um, there are directories uh, which I modularized in previous slides. The API directory has app.py, which is endpoint to get probabilities, and config file, prediction.py, preparation.py, and preprocessing.py. The test directory has four modules of test code for each. Now, when taking notes in the code, uh, you can use sharp comment out or doc strings. Uh, there are four, four kinds of doc strings, such as, uh, no, there are three kinds of uh, doc strings on slide, uh, such as restructured text style, NumPy style, Google style. So you can choose, you can choose the one that you like. But uh, I prefer to use Google, st Google style because other styles say parameters instead of arguments. I feel more comfortable for using arguments instead of parameters. On top of that, um, type hint can be the, one of the options, which some of you might already come up with idea. Uh, actually, but uh, actually any kinds of methods are okay to take notes. So understanding the requirements of each code is the most important here than how to write documents. So after we wrote test code, understood more than 70% or 80% of requirements of each code, so we can start to refactor it. So I'm gonna show you a case study with uh, refactoring the code to access BigQuery and GCS by using Google Cloud client libraries with Python. <clears throat> so there are two kinds of code on this side. Uh, the code A uses star and extract all of the data from the data set and output two dimensional arrays and it's called B has a role to extract three specific kinds of data from data set only when column one is not now. So zip query filters values and drop null. I suggest that you pre-process the data with query as much as possible if you use BigQuery, not using uh, Python or Pandas. <clears throat> this is because it is faster in a lower cost than pre-processed data with Python. The cost and the processing speed of the BigQuery is increased uh, based on the amount of data processed. <clears throat> I think uh, some of you are already know. So when uh, writing preparation, preparation code to access GCS, I suggest that you make bytes object and upload it from memory to GCS with Python. So I tended, I tended to write the code to make CSV files on local and load it 
and upload it from local PC to GCS. This is because it allows me to quickly uh, write the code. As a result, a large amount of CSV files sometimes stay in local PC and they consume extra memory of PC. So I suggest that you make by byte object. And however, <coughs> this code on this slide seems to be long. And <coughs> yeah. <coughs> so I should simplify more by developing or using a wrapper library. There are two kinds of code with Google client libraries, which I showed in the previous slides. And it combines and simplifies two kinds of codes. In so doing, it reduces the total amount of the code. So GCP accessor is a package I developed. Uh, if you have an interest in it, uh, speak with me uh, <coughs> later. So now uh, we can transform coding style with pandas into coding style with Python only in pre-processing pre code, all data in the API should be processed using the same data type. Uh, this improves readability and maintainability as opposed to prioritizing coding speed. So one day, I wondered why I struggled so much with refactoring of the repetitive code of pre-processing in a research-oriented code that I wrote uh, previous week. And I noticed that reason is that there are many coding styles with pandas, as you can see on the table. For example, filter function has six kinds of coding styles. I think that there are more than I wrote here. In case of coding style with Python, it just uses uh, basically list comprehension each function. On top of that, uh, different styles of code with pandas tend to be repetitive when trying to pre-process data in different ways. Uh, pandas is very powerful and useful for data wrangling, but as a code might decrease readability depending on situation. So the way of coding without pandas could be easier for engineers to read the code and it could increase uh, readability and maintainability. So now last step is to write the code to check if the code can work correctly. So there are two things to do. Write decorators to check parameters and set up production-like environment. So this is a, an image of decorators and APIs. After client sent request, API to check whether parameters are correct or not and check access token. And if something wrong with the code happened, error handler will catch the error. So if there are nothing wrong with the code, request will reach to the endpoint. But I, I, un, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to describe all of them. So I'm going to focus on talking about request parameter check. So I'm gonna show an example of request parameter check with JSON schema. This request car common has a student name and student grade as parameters. So this JSON file is sample JSON schema. In this file, you can define what data should be checked and how the data should be checked. So this make name grade.json file is defining the data type of student name as string and it, it must be included as request parameters. And the data type of student grade is also defined as string and it must be included as a true. And the maximum length of characters is limited in 120 and minimum length is one character. So in this example, request parameters are not allowed to be empty. So based on the JSON schema, the JSON validate.py validates request parameters. The first validate JSON function checks whether the JSON schema exists or not. The second validate schema function checks 
whether the request parameters are correct or not based on JSON schema defined in previous slide. So in order to execute uh, these functions, right, in order to execute these functions, write the function name as a syntax sugar under the endpoint, as it showed on the left side on this side. So as I looked over JSON validation code on the web, most of the code are like, like this on this side. So you can easily find it. <clears throat> so finally, uh, set up production like environment uh, with Flask or Python. Uh, these are just tools, and this conference is about Python. So I do not talk about how to use them in tutorials. So I just show you options. So first set up visualization to such as Tableau, Google Data Studio, and Redash and Luca. And when trying to automate continuous integration, GitHub, CircleCI, and PyTest might be common options. And after setting up CI environments, you can deploy on GCP. Uh, of course, the AWS is okay. So these might be typical options for ML APIs, as some of you might already know. So also, you can monitor the response speed of ML APIs and check the response by implementing system logs and analysis logs in advance because it is used for engineers to find the drift of model and debug the code. So I suggest that you also look up Flask or Python-based frameworks such as Flask App Builder dash Locust. The Flask App Builder allows you to manage and visualize data. Dash can make it possible to interactively con communicate with data. Locust is load test to which can also allow you to do scenario test. So these cloud services and tools should be used uh, depending on service size and the phases. Uh, if you need to consider scaling, you might need to think about the pipeline architectures or something, yeah. So, but I think, and that what I talk in this talk is a general things and common tips in any phases. So there are already a lot of resources by the tools on the web and tutorials are already presented in the past Python around the world. So you can look over them and by yourself later. So I'm gonna share this on my Twitter. So if you have an interest in it, you can follow me and look over it later. So let me quickly uh, summarize the uh, four steps to transform research-oriented code into ML APIs. Um, first step is to understand what research-oriented code in your project looks like and what component of ML APIs requires in your project and how to handle research-oriented code. And next is to modularize the research-oriented code through three small steps. So these are uh, to categorize it into preparation code, preprocessing code, and ML code, and then break them out into functions and make them testable. And then qualify input and the output of each code and define URI. And thirdly, it is refactoring. After preparing for refactoring and simplify IO code and preparation code and change the coding style with pandas into Python only in pre-processing code. So last three, uh, write the code to check how it can work correctly by implementing decorators or and setting up a production like environment. So yeah, uh, that's all. Um, thank you so much. Uh, if you have any interest in the education and technology domain, uh, feel free to contact with me. Uh, thank you.
Thank you for your presentation. Unfortunately, there seems to be no question and answer time left. So please, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please use uh, PyCon JP Fellow Slack. Uh, the time is up. We will end Mr. Jesse's talk. Thank you very much for your talk, oh, I everybody. Think, I, I want to say uh, one thing. So I think that everyone yeah. might have four Faces some difficulties to prepare, organize, attend, attend the Py, Py, Python conference because of COVID 19. But uh, I could successfully talk in PyCon JP. So say, thank you for organizing Py, PyCon and PyCon staff attendees. So today, thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, we will end uh, Mr. Jesse's talk. Thank you very much for your talk, everybody. Please give a, give a big round of applause to the speakers. Jesse, please stop your screen and finish. <laughs>